have the great pleasure to welcome you today for the second session of the Channels of Digital Scholarship Seminar for the academic year 2022-2023. Uh, this seminar is convened by Maison Francaise d'Oxford and Digital Scholarship at Oxford. I would like to thank the director of Maison Francaise d'Oxford, Pascal Marty, for supporting this seminar and all my colleagues who co-organize this scientific event. Tools and methodologies to analyze texts from different periods were presented in the previous ses sessions of the seminar last year. I have chosen for today's session to focus on deep fake and encoding. The culture of fake has existed along the centuries, but the digital turn has drastically altered the way fakes are created and disseminated all over the world in a very short period of time thanks to current technologies, and especially through social media. I want to focus on terminology and particularly on the collocation between the adjective deep and the noun fake. It seems interesting to me to point out that deep fake has no longer entered the Oxford English Dictionary, but we can hope that this term will soon appear in the OED. The generation of deep fake is intrinsically linked to the use of deep learning techniques to create fakes. Whereas deep fake is missing in the OED, deep learning appeared quite recently in September 2020. Here's the definition of deep learning. Machine learning based on artificial neural networks in which multiple layers of processing are used to extract progressively higher level features from data. I would like to thank our two keynote speakers for today's session, Dr. Bernie Hagen from the Oxford Internet Institute and Professor Massimo Leone from the University of Turin. I will give you some information about the format of the session. We will first listen to our first speaker, Dr. Bernie Hagen, and after his paper, you will be able to react and ask him questions. Afterwards, we will listen to our second keynote speaker, Professor Massimo Leone. His paper will also be followed by your questions. During uh, the Zoom webinar, I will ask you to mute your microphones during the talks and you could switch them on again if you want, if you want to ask questions later on. And you will be able to ask questions either by raising your hands or by typing your questions Sorry, uh, his most cited work reframed online self-presentation as an exhibition rather than a performance and articulated the potential of lowest common denominator self-presentation as pervasive online practice. Bernie is currently the director of Oxford's Master of Science in Social Data Science. His first book, From Social Science to Data Science, was published by Sage in 2023. He's a member of the Complex Data Collective, whose multi-grant NIH-funded software, Network Canvas, is among the most used software for data collection in personal social network analysis. In his paper, Bernie Hagen will focus on encoding, whereas the written name of an individual can be regarded as a signifier that encodes personhood, our keynote speaker will show that likeness is becoming encodable. Indeed, from different photos of a given individual, the Dream Booth software is able to generate model views of this person, which means that likeness can be identified and recognized by human beings in automatically generated digital images. 
Bernie Hogan will investigate the newfound potential of encoding the likeness, drawing on parallels with the name as a means of self-identification. He will especially present the philosophical concepts of proper likeness, which is quite similar to that of proper names. The title of his paper today is The Model That Matters, Encoding the Likeness as a Social Practice. Bernie, we're all listening to you. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. That was, uh, that was very kind and uh, long. Um, you know, <clears throat> this topic is really fun and it's exciting and it's a it's in a compelling place to be, but it sounds very dry. <laughs> I hope that the uh, the slides will be able to uh, uh, to enliven this somewhat uh, and give it kind of a visual flair because uh, certainly with deep fakes, the um, the part of the salience of it is simply the um, the recognizability of objects and how um, how evocative they can be. So maybe a picture tells a thousand words. So today we'll uh, we'll have a very uh, dense set of words uh, uh, to get through. Uh, so I'm going to uh, first just check, make sure everything's all good here. And uh, I'm gonna go share my screen. And uh, we can then confirm that uh, that I'm sharing the, uh, the right screen. And uh, hey, can everyone see the, uh, Oh, that's some of the, the secrets to the slides here. Let's go for that. All right, wonderful. So I'm assuming you can uh, you can all see the slide, the, the title slide here, uh, correct? Yes, it's perfect. All right, great. All right, wonderful. So uh, parental advisory, this, uh, this talk features a Dolly Parton level of uh, uh, sort of risqueness. It's not nudity, but it's a number of synthetic images of people in bikinis or beachwear, as well as discussions of sexuality. It doesn't directly confront the harms of sexism or normative body images in this talk, but those harms do exist and they pervade the AI generation community. You, you can't get very far in this community without uh, being confronted with this. Uh, so these, you know, these concerns don't need to be foregrounded in every talk, but they, they need to be, uh, they shouldn't just be dismissed as like moral matters. They actually can help us inform uh, sort of deep understandings of what it is we're talking about. Um, and, uh, you know, what we want to represent and even why people want to represent it. But there's not that much, but uh, there we are. Uh, so uh, I suppose I'd like to start with a statement that, uh, uh, you know, there's a difference between introducing oneself and making oneself known. Uh, this is kind of, uh, uh, I think, a, a central uh, distinction for me and for uh, for this sort of work that uh, we're going to be doing. I can draw upon a lot of different uh, sort of traditions for that, but I'll just I'll just leave that one there. Although I, perhaps I think the uh, the most salient would be Irving Goffman's distinction between uh, identity as something we give off or something that we give out. You know, so we can say, "Hi, I'm I, I'm Bernie." So th this is me. This is me giving uh, giving out my name. Uh, it's it's Bernie, uh, and uh, it's it's not a unique name per se, but it's probably uh, not entirely so common. Uh, and here's a picture of me. In fact, as it turns out, I'm wearing the, I'm wearing the same outfit today uh, as I'm wearing in this shirt. So uh, so you can you can you can guarantee you can recognize me from uh, uh, from this uh, from this image right here. Now this is this is not my name. So uh, if you if you were saying you you uh, saw a talk by someone, you, you probably wouldn't show them this would you you wouldn't like take a screenshot print it out and say hey i saw a talk by this guy no of course not you you'd say you, you had a you saw a talk by bernie <laughs> of course and you certainly wouldn't say that you saw a talk by by this guy right here this is an avatar but i mean you know i think it kind of looks like me uh i i put this together in uh, in apple now of course it's important to know that uh you know when when we talk to uh, uh, we say a talk by Bernie, we don't we don't mean in uh, Washington D.C. Then you you might be thinking of of, of somebody different. Uh, the thing mm -hmm. is, names are uh, uh, efficient uh, as ways of uh, designating individuals, but they're not very um, uh, they're not very distinctive. In fact, that's 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 deliberate. There's some really fascinating work in onomastics on how names are uh, conserved, uh, so that you know it's. You don't want to have to remember uh, an infinitely unique set of uh, names. You want to be able to remember an efficient set of names in order to be able to uh, uh, distinguish or refer to uh, somebody else. So how to make oneself known is different than how um, how to introduce oneself. I, I would introduce myself by saying, hi, here's my name and here's stuff about me. So the first way would be um, 
to be available for direct sensory experience. I'm simply present for you. Now that would be to give off an image, to give off a sound or uh, or smell. Um, we, we don't talk about smells a lot in culture, but uh, they're quite foundational. I mean, they're the way that uh, animals do this. Chemical signaling predates a lot of other informational signaling, and it is a means by which communication occurs through things being given off, you know, scent glands, sweat glands, et cetera. Now, the second way we, we might make oneself known is through a, a use of consistent uh, identifiers or informational traces. Uh, and so this isn't necessarily something that I give out as a, as a designator. That's number three. That's, that's the name. It's obvious. But kind of in between the name and uh, sort of direct sensory experience are, are, are these uh, forms of identification which are, um, which are consistent and reliable and they, they kind of represent uh, a person. Now, we might not say that this one right here, uh, in the middle here, this, this, this fellow, oh, there we go. We might not say that he actually uh, um, uh, represents my likeness, even though you, you might be able to identify me from that, but it would really depend on how <laughs> how broad the range of, of characters are, but the, but you don't have to. I mean, I also use this fellow right here, this, this, this blue guy uh, as well. See, the thing is, um, if we kind of flip that around and think instead of um, uh, how we... Uh, 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 how we make oneself known, but how we are known by someone else. Uh, we can think uh, of, well, first we, we recognize through sensory experience, but then we can also uh, recognize through symbolic reference. And uh, a symbolic referent here would be referred to as a um, like a proper name. Uh, now, I, I wasn't sure how far to get into a discussion of the, the proper name philosophically, but I, I do have a, a couple of slides going on it. Uh, but, you know, we can, we, we can uh, how to know someone else. I can know someone by knowing of their name. I can know of people I've read without even recognizing or having direct sensory experience. But we do fix that referent uh, by saying this is Caesar. And I've, you know, read this book by Caesar and it's, Caesar hasn't lived for, for many, many, many years. Uh, it, often Obama, I'd refer to Obama here uh, and these sorts of things, because that's a, for many people, that's a very unique one, very easy to recognize. But some others are uh, ambiguous, but they're still coherent as reference. Uh, and then the third one's through inference. Uh, so consistent or reliable traces. I mean, this is, we know people this way. You may know someone without knowing who they are insofar as you could name them, but you know there's a, the suspect always comes out at night. There's always someone walking this way. There's always this specific moose that seems that was in my backyard. And you could tell, and it wasn't necessarily the sounds that they gave off, but there were traces uh, in the environment uh, uh, remaining there of this. The, the, the state had changed because of their, their presence. Now, of, co of all of these ways to know someone, uh, the one that we, we tend to uh, have, have an, the most theorizing on, I think most philosophical theorizing, quite interesting, um, is the one related to language. And that's the, the name. Uh, and that's through the notion of a proper name. Now, uh, if we're getting to a proper likeness, then what is what's the proper name? Uh, well, proper names uh, have a really fascinating history in language and in their use. Uh, a long discussion, which yeah, I will I will totally glaze over uh, for this talk to to get to the deep fake stuff. Um, but uh, it kind of ends in a way with uh, a, difference a difference between, between a, kind a kind of school, school. based with uh, John Searle and uh, sort of an article that he uh, he did in the late fifties um, on the proper name. Um, which is uh, the proper name is this way in um, which we come to know a thing. And so we might call it like duck theory or maybe inverted duck theory. Um, I know a, a, not a, a duck is not a, a unique uh, thing, but it's if, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, we would, we would say it's a duck. But that's why it's inverted duck theory is it's not that, uh, you know, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it is that um, we notice there's a thing that walks like a duck and quacks like a duck. Um, and quacks in its own way. We're going to need to like have a thing, a name for that. So we'll, we'll call it duck or we'll call it Donald duck. Now, the problem with this way of describing that's what a name is, um, is functionally is that it's fragile. Is that, you, you know, with you, with a proper name, if you use this sort of way of building things up to say that's um, why that's Obama, it's because, you know, he's the president or was the president and then Trump was the president and then Biden in, in the U.S., whatever. And uh, the the notion there, the the issue um, is that, well, what if Obama was never elected or what if he wasn't elected a second time or 
what if Trump was reelected or, uh, you know, within various uh, elections that we have over here, <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn, for example, if he was elected, uh, we, you know, we, uh, we won't say right now that in those possible worlds, um, we're referring to somebody different. Uh, we, we know who we're talking about when we say, you know, someone did or did not win an election or um, did or did not score a goal. What we're doing then actually is something different. We're fixing a reference. And this is um, this is from Kripke. It's really fascinating uh, and kind of, a, uh, I don't know, I, I understand this to be a big deal in, in, uh, in philosophy uh, through naming and necessity. I think it's an absolutely marvelous book. Um, but uh, Kripke comes up with the uh, this notion of rigid, rigid designators, you know, that they um, they refer to a specific referent. And we kind of take an assumption that a referent exists, that, that things are there, things are the case. <laughs> I am here. Uh, and so uh, this, me, would be a um, referent in a sort of semiotics. We might say sign, signifier, signified. Um, um, he uses the term designatum. It's not really a pretty term. <laughs> I'm normally just going to say referent. We're going to say like, this is the thing. Um, and so when I refer to Obama, we know who I'm talking about. Maybe some people, you may have met him. Uh, I don't know. I One of my students worked for him. From, she was from America. I'm from Canada. <laughs> but uh, so anyway, proper names have a special place in, in culture and philosophy. They're really important. <laughs> They're really central. They help us establish identities. Uh, I mean, other evidence does too, but the proper name is unique in that it fixes a reference across all possible worlds, which I think is a really cool idea. So, uh, and that's, you know, this notion. And it's not that we say that there is an Obama in all possible worlds. We say in all possible contingencies or these counterfactuals, we still know who we're referring to um, because it's been fixed by this name. So either this person exists uh, and we can imagine them in different situations or they don't exist. Uh, and then from that, you can establish that that's the pivot of this proper name. But it's not that a proper name is the only one that does this. It's just that it's the one that we, we find the most uh, efficient and it's the one we use in language. It's the ones that we as humans have been most easily readily able to encode. We can like write it down, it's phonetic, and whatever, and send it to others. And then and and then decode, um, uh, we, or sorry, encode, you know, we can hear or understand what the language is and then decode represented materially. Um, okay, so proper names, uh, you know, I'm not sure how much I need, need to uh, spell them out to people. Everyone here has one, <laughs> I would imagine. Uh, and... Uh, you know, depending on this, uh, the, the the jurisdiction, other things like pseudonyms can be considered personally identifying information, but everyone considers this one, uh, you know, personally identifying uh, information. Now, to, to note, um, a proper name is a, is a philosophical and a, and a linguistic concept. Uh, a legal name is a sociopolitical one. So to conflate the two is to overreach the law. I can I can use somebody uh, in a story by a name that we've established as a nickname. Um, I was at one point uh, referred to as Nerny. And so, like, that could be uh, considered a proper name from the way in which language is used, but not necessarily as a uh, legal name in terms of governance. It's not necessarily a name that has been registered or indexed for the specific thing, but you can still establish someone using that name. Um, and, uh, okay, so now a name versus a likeness. So it, in, in practice, you know, in reality, we don't um, we 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 don't acknowledge our um, you know communication with each other uh, through our names. We I, I don't uh, I don't normally say my name at the beginning of my communication uh, uh, like like birds do. Bur uh, a lot of birds uh, a lot of birds that uh, sort of chirp a unique song for attracting mates will will preamble this with a, a unique designator which uh, we take to mean their name. Uh, but they don't really use it for each other. They don't they don't gossip. They, they, it doesn't have the same function as being both a self-identifier and an identifier of a, of a third party. Um, a name does, that's a pretty important and unique thing about it. Okay, but, uh, but a likeness, you know, it's established through recognition rather than relation. Um, with a name I'm assigning it to me, I'm saying there's this word called Bernie and then you, it's, it's my name, <laughs> whatever. Um, but I'm not saying this, this is a face called this, I just, I just present this face. <laughs> I just give it off. And, you know, we say, you know, can you turn on your cameras? Because we assume that, you know, you're going to present your likeness. Um, okay, so I'm not going to give you an extra photo for future recognition. Uh, you know, I'm going to say, uh, I know a name is an easily uh, encoded and decoded means of signifying the referent. The likeness, you know, on the other hand, you know, is is actually probably a little older than the name. 
And it's probably more primal than the name, but it's very natural. Um, and it's it's naturally encoded through through existence. We we we, <laughs> we simply have a likeness because it's the thing that we give off to others. Um, and it's and it's decoded through through cognition. You you just like you see me. You or if you have if you you know sight abled. Uh, otherwise, if you uh, if you are listening, you're 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 hearing me. Uh, you're you know you're you're getting that likeness. So if you heard another uh, podcast or interview of mine, you probably go, "That's that fella from that." Uh, from that talk I was at, okay, and that you could detect that uh, that that likeness. So uh, the reason uh, that I think it's probably been given a, a kind of short shrift is because it's not been uh, so easily encoded and decoded until now. Now, instead of the likeness, we've been more concerned with the encodings of the likeness. We would talk about the improper circulation of an image or um, of a recording of me. Like, did you record me falsely? Now that's not necessary, that, that connotes my likeness, but it is not, it does not denote my likeness. It denotes me. It denotes like, you know, the, the act of, of uh, the referent, uh, me who is, uh, who is speaking. The thing is, we haven't really been uh, circulating likenesses themselves. We haven't really been able to think of them as objects that are distinct because normally the decoding and encoding process is separate. An artist might be a trained person that can decode a likeness for someone. Um, but the encoding kind of comes through the artist's subjectivity. It's like, I'm going to see this and, and enact it. Okay, but, but now, so what do we mean by the likeness? Okay, perhaps we should let the likeness explain. All right, so so here's here's a person from uh, this person uh, does not exist. Uh, they they don't exist. They're not they're not real. They were they were never real. They might look like someone you know. Do they look like someone you know? Or they look familiar, perhaps? Um, but no, they were um uh, they were done using a a, a GAN, a generalized adversarial network, a sort of neural network uh, where uh, an image is cross-checked against a, a database of, of other images, or rather a model, uh, to see, does this look like a person? Because I know what persons look like. And if it doesn't look like a person, you should change it. And the person goes, and the model, the second model goes, oh, I'll change it. And then kind of ping pongs back and forth. Um, so uh, this is uh, some, some links to this. This person does not exist. Of course, this has now become kind of commercialized. You can see a level of plasticity in this. And now look at the plasticity of the of age. What's happening here is not uh, that we're really altering the fundamental likeness of this character here in some ways. We're, we're saying they're older, um, but you'll notice it's not like painting makeup on. It's, it's kind of invoking age within this generative person, which does not exist, incidentally. Now, uh, to kind of look a little under the hood on these right here, uh, this is uh, an example of a prompt for this sort of thing. And people are like, Wow. Okay. I just fired up this thing. I learned how to do it using a, a program, a stable diffusion, whatever. I'll, I'll get to the, some of the stuff under the hood in a minute. Um, but they're like, yeah, you can just pull people out of thin air right now. And then, and then here is the, uh, um, here's the actual details for the, uh, for the model for that. And I'll actually return to this later. So we'll talk more about it. Now, these images connote a likeness, you know, connote and denote really, uh, important distinctions, of course. Uh, and, uh, they, but not a proper likeness. And uh, they're not meant to denote a specific referent, uh, i.e. a specific person in the world. They are meant to connote personness by looking like a person. And that's, that's an important distinction. So now, how are they doing this? Well, they're using AI, which, as everyone knows, stands for artificial inference. <laughs> not artificial. I mean, of course, we 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 uh, we hang our heads over whether it's actually intelligence or not. Um, and I don't know when it talks back. Maybe we'll have a conversation about whether it's intelligent. But in the meantime, I think it's just easy to call it artificial inference or think of it as artificial inference and 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 move on <laughs> and ask what is inferring and what are they inferring on uh, and and how are they producing what they they get out of it. So I'll focus mainly on images. Of course, we're talking about we're getting to deep fakes and that sort of stuff. <clears throat> and uh, so here's a here's a, a model workflow. This, you could you couldn't actually make uh, anything using this workflow, uh, but uh, you know it kind of gets you a sense of what one does. But you know the 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 fact is uh, you can still generate these images yourself using on off the off the shelf. Uh, or open source tools uh, and models that are available. Um, but generally, you'll either need access to cloud computing via Google um, or cloud computing via a third-party server that uh, uh, you can hook up yourself. Um, 
or uh, you'll be have to buy GPUs because uh, these uh, generating these things uh, requires some rather uh, considerable, but not wholly inaccessible technologies. That's the thing. They're kind of like high prosumer grade. This is what uh, people who had really good video games would already have a computer that can do these. No prob. Um, okay, so step one, gather millions of images, like lots of images, billions of images, um, tons of them. Now, uh, label each of these images with some feature in the in the images. You know, that's like doing those captures where like, is, this a, is there a crosswalk in here or whatever, this labeling. Now, for what it's worth, it's important to note that you don't have to label all of the images with all of the things in the images. That's kind of uh, a neat part of this, and we'll get to that in a bit. But, you know, you do need to have some labels. And remember that labels don't necessarily have to be uh, things like writing in text semantically what is in the picture. Labels will also include things like the dimension of the picture. They will include the, the color scheme or so forth. Uh, they, you know, uh, the sort of camera that it was made with, all that EXIF information can kind of go in there as well to help inform uh, what's in, in the picture. Now use an algorithm to train the model. Now, what is the model? The model is, it's a, it, it'll end up being a big set of numbers um, and a way of navigating those numbers. Um, it's parameters and weights. The weights allow the model to encode the general sense of an image, but not the specific image in detail. Um, now we share this model with others then, or we, or we lock it up. And if we lock it up, we can often then um, fish out a little bit of access to it for pay. Uh, that's, uh, that's what, um, uh, some companies do with their social media data right now. Uh, that's Twitter is going to do that with, uh, Twitter data starting next week. That's going to create chaos. Um, <laughs> it, they, they just tweeted that they are going to, uh, uh, not have a free API, uh, anymore. So, uh, check the news. It'll be, I think it'll be what everyone's talking about next week. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but, uh, anyway, so we'll see. So now we have a number of these sort of approaches with do the same thing, uh, we have open uh, API, which meters out credits, and you can buy some credits and, and so forth. And, and then we have stable diffusion, which is kind of given away a model and a way of training it. Uh, and then mid journey, which also does a sort of subscription service. So, right, you, you, there's choices for how one deploys these models. And then you use a decoder uh, to generate an image from the model. Now, whether you do it or whether the, you know, it's done for you through the API, if you're like doing Dolly or whatever, is the same thing. Now, you use prompts to steer the result towards some sort of likeness. Now, remember we, where we are with likenesses. Okay, so where are we getting the images from? This is Leon right here, it's Leon 5B. This is, uh, that's, um, they're just a network uh, um, of uh, researchers and they've compiled just an image of all the images on the web. So these are live on the web right now. And uh, what it has done is also uh, uh, found a way to uh, classify the images. You can see here, um, you can see here walking on a beach. Uh, and you'll notice here, this is a clip retrieval. That's um, a combined uh, language image. Um, oh, I can't remember what the P stands for. Parameters. <laughs> uh, but it's a it's a model for decoding uh, this sort of stuff. So clip models are really useful and important. Um, like uh, GPT, uh, for example, everyone likes the chatbots. And uh, uh, so th that sort of thing is based on a language model. Now, using the language model, you can infer a lot of things about the text without having all the text. So if you see some parts of this image detailed walking on a beach and another part, you know, um, sunset at, you know, um, sunset at the ocean, it will know that they're referring to similar things because they're in similar parts of the semantic space. So you don't need the full elaboration of this. And then it can cross check in the image. Okay, it's, does it have a sunset? Because it seems like some of these have sunsets and so forth. So clip is very clever and it helps draw on and uh, help facilitate inferences. Otherwise, we would not be able to train on every single image or label every image. So instead, it, it does this sort of stuff, uh, puts it together, and uh, then you get a, a model, which is like a, a, a big file. <laughs> and then you can, uh, you can use that file by uh, decoding it. Uh, so uh, Stable Diffusion gives us some insight because it's the one that has uh, released this model. And so there's uh, uh, then what you get is checkpoint files. So there's a trained Stable Diffusion checkpoint uh, file. It's like four gigabytes. Uh, and they just released a 2.1. And every time they train, it's that they, they focus more on some images than others or annotate the images in a different way or otherwise use a different uh, clip algorithm to kind of train it within the semantic space a little more differently. So different things about the picture become more important. The elephants and the tigers become more important and the, the greenery becomes less important when they're looking for the distinctions, whatever. So anyway, so these these models then uh, get trained, they get uh, 
put together and then you can run them. You can run them like this. This is a, on Hugging Face. You can do this yourself in Google Collab. This is like a panel you get um, and you select which, which checkpoint. The checkpoints might be like four gigabytes. Uh, you type in the text. This is text to image. This is amazing. Uh, and this one just said mermaid. <laughs> and this is the anything checkpoint. This is a one that's uh, uh, from, from China, uh, I believe. And um, I think it was trained by Tencent. Uh, and then this is what you get for a mermaid from, uh, from the anything model. Uh, here, there's a whole bunch of parameters that help shape how you explore that space. Um, and so as we returning to this right here, we can see these parameters right here, uh, negative ones right here, cartoon, ugly eyes, two people. So it really says don't have that, none of that. And then, then I believe it does the, uh, the, the positive ones right here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, photo of one 29 year old woman pale skin homeless in new york city uh in the comments to this the guy says homeless worked actually to give the hair kind of a kind of a sort of frazzledness uh it wasn't trying to evoke anything uh otherwise than that it was weird and so it, interestingly he was using that noticing that being a thing that was evoked in the parameter space right there in fact people are now exploring these parameter spaces this is a fascinating one this is um, a, a photo of a young uh, blank woman on a beach and each one of the things in the rows are uh, words from average emaciated anorexia uh, skinny well endowed buff muscular beefy stocky chubby overweight uh, curvy big uh, you can see that a, a lot of them really evoke slightly different body shapes um, but they they do evoke those body shapes with a consistency but um, it's not guaranteed that you're going to get any one of them but they just have a, a kind of a, a likeness to it but now the important thing is uh, where do we get a proper likeness we'll get there um so i'm gonna have to zip a little bit through the the next couple uh slides i don't want to uh uh overwhelm this um but anyway so um inference now just to remember this here's an example and here's the dolly parton level stuff we're getting through that oh well, just that but you'll notice this is image to image where what it's doing by inferring from other images like this what these things should look like so we have a you know a, a picture of elizabeth right there and so look at this. this is what she should look like and and here more fascinating this is a cartoon and uh this is an inference this image right here was inferred the, the real one was inferred, that the real one, the photorealistic one, was inferred from the cartoon via image to image. Now, doing this, uh, you know, levels of inference can be good or bad. Right here, just look at this. This is in painting. It said here, a portrait of an Oxford academic in front of a neon cyberpunk library uh, with daylight. That's not really much of a cyberpunk library to me. I don't know. Maybe it is, but it's blurry, so we can't really tell. Uh, it's, you know, it's okay. Um, now, <laughs> here's image to image on my portrait. Uh, as, as we can see here, this is, um, Dolly doesn't have my proper likeness in there. Dolly is looking at this picture, finding statistical regularities, and then saying, I, uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a chunky, I guess, bearish guy, I suppose. I'm, I'm not that, uh, <laughs> but anyway, that's where it goes with that. Maybe I'm a little more recognizable than I am with uh, this. So in this uh, photo right here, we can see a so I try instead with a more denotated portrait of a blue-eyed ginger, bearded brunette, 40-year-old academic in a pink shirt, colorful tie, blah, slightly asymmetric. And it's, I don't, it, it, um, I guess I need a darker background. Uh, I don't know, <laughs> and to look more serious in my photos. So they don't capture my likeness, but they weren't trained on it. So here's the thing. The models themselves can be trained now and extended. So once you have this model trained, um, like the Anything 3.0 model, then you can extend that, push it in a certain direction with your own likeness, and then we have something like Dream Booth. Now, this evokes a proper likeness. This is one that's been a, a Dream Booth model of this person, and they then put themselves in a variety of different uh, uh, portraits. Uh, there's an astronaut and so forth. They're certainly not the only one. This guy I find quite uh, charming. This is uh, Stealthy. He's a time traveler. So here he is with Darwin and... Uh, <laughs> Uh, there is, he even goes into art, uh, which has been generated. Here he is with Picasso. Uh, and, and the photos are really quite great. I mean, you're going to work really hard to convince yourself that this is, a, a, you know, a synthesized photo. You know it. And so you will be like, this is, of course, it's not him with Picasso. But they're good now. They're, they're good enough. And he's, he's been able to sweeten these pretty, uh, pretty reliably with lots of inference. Okay, so, and, you know, Stealthy, the Stealthy in this, is not real either. Uh, let's let's point out this is not. Uh, he did he did not Photoshop himself in the. He, there's not a a denotative um, referent photo <laughs> of the guy either. 
the guy was also in the model, right? So the model then evokes both him and uh, and Darwin or uh, uh, or the others. But uh, with that one as well, I just I love it. But now it's important to note that Dream Booth training a style or a likeness, if you will, uh, doesn't have to be a proper likeness. It, it, um, so here we had to, you can train it on um, uh, the Simpsons. And then as we can see, some of these things might, uh, we might signify as proper objects like Golden Gate Bridge. You know, I think it's Bill Gates, I suppose, and probably Trump or something. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, this also gives us a question to whom is the likeness uh, recoverable and how recoverable should it be? Um, but now the model era is here. These likenesses are, are, are real, and uh, they're, they're not they're not like the, the future. <laughs> they're the now. Um, so this is a Civit AI. Uh, you can download any of these models right there, and then they'll have a, a prompt or a tag for a specific um, aesthetic or style uh, or a person. It'll be just a model of that'll give you a really good rendering of a person, or in this case, one that'll give you a really good rendering of this this aesthetic right here. This is you know. So now confronted with the likeness in this way, we've got to acknowledge that it's something that can be encoded through data as well as through sensory experience. It's not just sensory anymore. It's a lot more complex than a name, but uh, it's still an encoding that can be decoded to produce um, a, a rigid uh, designator, uh, like in the Kripkean sense. Um, the nature of this process produces results that far exceed simple questions above, you know, should you see this person in this situation? <laughs> um, however, I believe that invoking the proper likeness, we can get uh, uh, maybe a, like a more useful grip uh, on these questions. Now, importantly, uh, the notion of a proper likeness, I think, consolidates in a non-technical way uh, many of the specific issues that have heretofore been tech-specific. Um, now, I, I, if you give me a, a time flag, I can uh, wind this down whenever, but I've got about, uh, it says slide 40 of 47, so it's kind of the last point here, is an, uh, kind of applying this, you know, reframing questions about digital media. So now what is a deep fake? A deep fake uh, refers to deep learning, of, of framing a machine learning that practices uh, or practices that to create models of data. Uh, the depth comes from the abstraction. No image is um, is exactly encoded in the model. Uh, only weights are encoded in the model. Now, the recovery of a specific image from that model would be seen as a problem. That would be like you didn't do a good enough job. You have overtrained on that photo, or that you know. There is examples of uh, in the Leon data set um, photos that appear through like hundreds of different links. So, depending on how you engineer your prompt, you can absolutely recover that exact photo in some of these stable diffusion models. But that's a problem. That's because it's overtrained on um, different photos, which were actually the same uh, the same image. But uh, the point is that it's still, um, you know, about deep learning. Uh, and you're, you're not really supposed to get uh, the original referent back. That would be um, very superficial. You're supposed to get it from some eigenvalues or and so forth. You're supposed to, an abstraction. Now, fake in this sense refers to the decoding of the deep learning model in a way that creates a, a recognizable figure. But now one might ask, does a deep fake have to be of a recognizable figure or any figure or a proper likeness? And I say it has to be a proper likeness that we ought to consider the distinction between a synthetic image and a deep fake. Now, uh, a generative image models now exist that can produce figures we would recognize as, as humans. And some of these we would recognize as specific humans. To stabilize the distinction between a synthetic image and a deep faked image, we can suggest the properties contained within the image itself. Does the image contain a proper likeness? That is, does it contain sufficient information uh, in, in order to signify to someone that the image refers to that subject? Can I say, oh, that's definitely Obama in that? Now, conversely, if there is no proper likeness, then the image cannot be said to be a fake, for it does not refer to a truth. It's only an abstraction. Um, it's an inference, but it's not a it's not a truth. It's not the way that we establish uh, um, uh, a truth in the sort of fixing a reference sense. Uh, now, we uh, we must confront the fact that we may not be able to make the distinction ourselves between a synthetic and a fake, even if that distinction holds in the image. Um, if you only saw one of these, you might not know that it was trained on a specific face until you saw the other four and go, oh, that's clearly the, you know, that, that one guy. So, so, you know, when's it, when is it a deep fake? When it invokes a proper likeness, that means that it was present in the training data and not just incidentally, but that it was denoted using some signifier. Now the signifier doesn't have to be the person's real name. Um, that's a different rigid designator. It's a different signifier. It does this or, uh, you know, but it could be face 002, but it's still a, 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 a unique establishable likeness that we can use to fix a referent. Uh, and it can be invoked during decoding such as that we can recognize the likeness from the generated image.
So now does that mean anything with a prompt? Uh, isn't anything with a prompt a deep fake? You know, if all prompts refer to likenesses, they're all deep fakes, aren't they? And I'm like, well, no, a prompt doesn't necessarily fix a reference to something we can establish as true. We can talk about houses without referring to any specific house. If we, if we only train on a single house or only label one house as house, then the program would treat house to mean that single house. But the same could be said for man, woman, or president. You know, the, the, the point is that would be a form of exploring bias within the model, um, bias we'd want to correct because it doesn't really refer to a sufficiently general concept. Now, the likeness is latent in the data, but it's recognizable from the data, just like my likeness is recognizable from this, this visual image. You know, um, if the prompt is not uh, supposed to refer to a unique designatum, someone with a proper likeness, but rather a class of objects, you know, it's supposed to be like, just make a, an Oxford academic, whatever. Um, then we shouldn't be able to recover the likeness of that designatum from the prompt. We shouldn't be able to um, recover. If I, if Dolly trained on me and you, you spell out a whole bunch of stuff about me, we shouldn't be able to, uh, in a kind of deterministically way, deterministic way, get this likeness. Um, otherwise, we've overtrained. Okay, so uh, I mean, this is kind of it, wrapping it up. It doesn't mean, uh, the deepfake uh, doesn't mean simply a video that looks like someone or a video that comes from a model that was trained on one's images. It means that uh, you know we can reasonably expect our likenesses to also be trained upon, but that's not the same as being trained upon in a way that can be decoded and evoked. And uh, so this also helps us understand more distinctly uh, risks with uh, facial recognition systems and so forth. Um, and uh, you know, I just think that they're they're real and they symbolize a rigid designator. Uh, and uh, so anyway, you know, that's it some new questions that come from this notion of a proper likeness. For governance, we might ask, what rights do people have to their proper likeness as manifested in the training model? Um, that's beyond any biometrics. For business, we might ask, what property rights do people have? You know, can you, can you train on me and then sell that model? Do, do, I have, uh, do I have ownership of that? I probably should. Uh, there's probably some causal means by which one could establish that. Or should they? What if you're a public figure? Is that the distinction? Um, you know, so we're at the cusp of an area of training or licensing or sharing these likenesses. The latest is that you can get this down to like 30 megabytes now um, if you train on an expected model. So it doesn't have to be a new four gigabytes. We can now pop them in emails. <laughs> uh, for humanities and social science, we might ask, when is a likeness sufficiently recognizable to suggest that the model has sufficiently successfully decoded the likeness? Is this like a information theory question or is this a you have to go out and ask people question because it varies by culture? I don't think we know. <laughs> Does this depend on social categories? Are some people more or easily decoded than others? Is this talk more easily or less decoded than others? Uh, and with that, I'll thank you. Thank you so much, Bernie, for this uh, very brilliant presentation um, and very rich, of course. I think there will be a lot of questions. I certainly have a lot of questions. wants to start for the questions. Well, I don't know if I'm allowed to ask questions as well. Or, of course. Or, yeah, from members. <laughs> thank you. So <laughs> see, th th thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bernie, for this uh, fascinating talk. I mean, uh, combining uh, uh, technical knowledge and also a philosophical background, which is uh, quite quite rare, so it's uh, it's it's very enriching. Um, I, I wanted to ask you whether you you conceive of this uh, notion of likeness uh, as something that uh, um, is somehow defined in the terms of uh, let's say analytical philosophy, so as something that it is a, a universal, or as something that on the contrary. Um, uh, it, it is subject to um, variations uh, in terms of how 
it is conceived by groups, for instance. Uh, is it is a likeness uh, always the same and always alike? The, the likeness of likeness uh, along the spectrum, or or can we conceive uh, of changes in, in space and time? I don't know if my question is clear. Yeah, yeah. I get you. I, of course, of course. Like, could you recognize me from an old photo of me? And would you be able to, to establish is it the same me? I mean, this is actually a really uh, important question within um, within analytic philosophy in terms of uh, like the rigid uh, designator and the designatum. Um, and so, yeah, I do believe it's a it's the it's a universal. Uh, and but the, the universal is not is often misunderstood. Uh, it doesn't mean like that I have this likeness that Bernie Hogan has this likeness in all universes. It means <clears throat> that in all universes, we can establish whether or not this likeness refers to me. <laughs> and I know that sounds, that sounds uh, solipsistic, um, but uh, it, it takes um, a, a sort of... Uh, a, a, sort of a location of agency in the in the person who's doing the uh, the understanding. Uh, it's it's like it was the same with the real name. We just say we fix a referent. Um, uh, and that doesn't mean that that person is in every universe, but it means that we can establish um, the 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 counterfactual. We can say that uh, we're, you know who we're referring to. <laughs> Whether they did it, that thing or they didn't do that thing, we're going to use evidence to establish that. But you know who we're referring to, and uh, and uh, the, the same will go for a likeness. Uh, the point is, um, I, I think. Well, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I agree with all that in analytic. Well, not all. <laughs> it's impossible to agree with all of it in analytic philosophy, uh, but I do believe with the uh, the Kripkean uh, sort of transcendental. Oh, what's gosh, what's that called? Uh, um, uh, it doesn't matter. Anyway, it is a kind of a neoplatonistic, almost like neo-idealism, post-Kantian uh, vibe. But it, uh, it, I think it's very useful because it helps us establish that um, we understand each other by virtue of assuming that we understand each other. I know that's tautological, but it says we both believe that we're establishing an understanding of the same referent. Uh, now we we normally do that with language, but we can uh, it, we we wouldn't normally do that with reference. Uh, but you don't have to look very far to see us doing it with reference, uh, with likenesses all the time and with proper likenesses everywhere. Uh, you know, portraiture. Uh, when we uh, recognize uh, you know the Colonel Sanders from KFC, uh, there was a case about the likeness of Dolly Parton in the '80s about someone who was evoking her likeness with like a sort of um, uh, a, a, um, a line art drawing it was curvy figure and big hair and uh, they were advertising a country show and uh, Dolly was like that they can't do that that's that's mine um, and the court was able to establish that it was her likeness that was being uh, uh, invoked in this who so didn't have to say Dolly um, so it, it, you know the, the the transcendentalness of this is that we know what we were referring to when we say it's either it's Dolly's likeness that was invoked um, we don't have to establish we don't have to like uh, have it at the uh, like a an, an empirical level because it can't be at an empirical level. It has to be at an ideal level because it has to be a shared referent. Um, uh, because we can invoke that likeness uh, in different new new images. You can re-render a new version of me. I will be different. Uh, now the stability of it is a, is a different matter entirely. And yeah, uh, I don't know how um, how the stability of that of of that likeness you know uh, plays into this. We will age over time, and we will have. You know, we won't, who knows if it will be saying that it is referring to the same referent, but insofar as we believe in the continuity of the body, that I am, as we establish that the, the baby that was me is the, the old man that is me, then uh, they both refer to the same thing just at different points in that person's age. Um, but gosh, that's really complicated analytic philosophy stuff. I'm going to stop there. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there are there other questions? I have I have a, not a question but a, a comment actually. Um, Bernie, you uh, mentioned uh, Kripke's theory of uh, rigid de designators. Uh, I used uh, this theory a lot uh, when I wrote my PhD because uh, it's quite relevant, especially um, in fiction when we try to underline and uh, when we are interested in the way uh, an author uses uh, designators uh, to depict characters. 
and the evolution throughout a novel uh, for these uh, designators. So I think it is really relevant, especially uh, in your presentation with the uh, with, uh, yeah. identities and deep fakes. And, and the, the funny thing is, is that the, the thing is that the deep fake it, it shouldn't just be like we make any image. It should be we make an image where we can refer to a specific person. We know who we're talking about. And if we don't know who we're talking about, then I guess it wasn't good enough. Uh, that's where I actually lean more on a pragmatist definition of this as being relevant uh, than um, than an idealist one. The idealism comes from the fact it, it is kind of borrowed in the like, the likeness is a real thing. It's the proper likeness is a real thing. Um, because much like, you know, in, in language, we have designators. But the thing is, we haven't been able to decode them. We can do impressions of people, uh, but not decode them. And the decoding, and encoding and decoding process is um, is is new uh, because it involves this sort of creation of a sort of this multimodal way of um, representing aggregates through inference. Uh, and so now we can decode a likeness. So I think we we should resuscitate the uh, the designator um, because it's going to be uh, it's going to be big. I mean, the last sort of social media stuff was all some people, myself included, would have referred to it as the real name web, but the, or you know, I guess you could linguistically call it the proper name web. Uh, you know, after GeoCities and uh, IRC and stuff, we had a web of proper names, but now we're having a web of proper likenesses. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, I don't know if we uh, have time to take other questions. Uh, I can't see any questions in the chat window. Oh, yes. Um, we have a, a question from Rosa Franz. Could we talk of a likeness for a purely numeric character? It's just Mike. Bernie? Yeah, that's fascinating. Well, again, back, um, I always come back to like, um, we're fixing a reference, and we're fixing a reference uh, in order to establish truth. So insofar as that um, Mike the Vocaloid exists, um, it is a thing that renders stuff. Um, we can say that it has some sort of likeness. Now, whether we can establish a proper likeness means that we can establish distinctively that it's how we recognize Mike from how we recognize something else. And if we can't establish how we recognize Mike the Vocaloid from a different AI system, then we can't say that Mike the Vocaloid has a proper likeness. Thank you, Bernie. Maybe we might have time for just another question. Oh, cheers, thank you. But maybe if there is time, another another question. Um, I know maybe I got distracted, but uh, I I, uh, I didn't hear any mention of um, uh, NFTs, non fungible tokens, and I wondered whether that could be related to um, uh, your talk on uh, you know mm. somehow likeness and uh, certifying ah. digital likeness. Oh, of course. Well, an NFT is a uh, is a cargo cult for capitalism. Uh, it's the idea that we should find a form of cryptographic uh, scarcity in order to organize our information. Uh, so, an, an NFT is a like a digital signing token on a uh, on a blockchain. Uh, it means that like. Only you with the password can establish it, but you know you can definitely say that you you own this this thing. You can definitely make that mapping within this system and make it and securely establish that within that system. But if we don't care about that system, then who cares? And this, if the system itself is burning up a bunch of carbon, much like a lot of these renderings are, uh, it's it's just like a waste of our time. Uh, it's the, and we, the planet does not have enough time for us to just be generating cryptographic numbers for artificial scarcity in a uh, in a system where we ought to be theorizing about what we do when people are going to beat that and just going to not care about the scarcity. They're just going to, they're going to trade likenesses anyway. <laughs> Sociopolitically, we've done this through centralization, I guess. And, uh, and so that might be the same. Will, will OpenAI become a social media company with the synth Facebook? I totally agree. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very, very pleased to welcome today uh, Professor Massimo Leone from the University of uh, Turin. Thank you so much 
for taking part in this webinar today. Uh, Massimo Leone is a professor of philosophy of communication, cultural semiotics, and visual semiotics at the Department of Philosophy and Educational Sciences at the University of Turin in Italy. He is also a part-time professor of semiotics in the Department of Chinese Language and Literature at the University of Shanghai in China. And he is also an associate member of Cambridge Digital Humanities. He is also the director of the Institute for Religious Studies at the Bruno Kessler Foundation in Trento. He has been a visiting professor at several universities in the five continents. He has single authored 15 books, edited more than 50 collective volumes, and he published more than 500 articles in semiotics, religious studies, and visual studies. He is the winner of the 2018 ERC Consolidated Grants. He is editor-in-chief of Lexia, the semiotic journal of the Center for Interdisciplinary Research on Communication at the University of Turin. He is co-editor-in-chief of Semiotica and co-editor of the book series Isagi di Lexia in Rome, Semiotics of Religion, and also Advances in Faith Studies. Massimo Leone's, Massimo Leone's research focuses on the semiotic ideology of deep fakes. He analyzes the semiotic ideology of generative adversarial networks and their consequences in terms of production and reception of deep fakes. In his paper today, Massimo Leone will highlight the sense of pleasure we experience in front of deep fakes that are getting more and more frequent and popular in digital communication. He will investigate the reactions and comments we have when we watch fake videos created through artificial intelligence. He especially analyzes the real deep fakes that produce social and pragmatic effects in the interactions between the characters they represent and their audience. His paper will focus on the complex relationship between amusement and falsehood, exploring the more general hypothesis that in contemporary digital communication, fun is actually the Trojan horse of falsehood in the construction of public opinion. The title of his paper is Deep Fake and Shallow Fun, the Semiotic Hypothesis. Massimo, we are listening to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Grégoire, uh, for this uh, uh, invitation. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity. And uh, uh, thank you also for the very generous um, uh, presentation um, and introduction of my, of my work. Um, so I, I would like to say something about uh, how uh, I became interested in, in deep fakes. Um, initially, my interest was not in deep fakes, it, it was in faces. Uh, the face, the human face, um, has been my object of investigation for the past uh, years, uh, I would say, at least since 2016, 2017. Um, and it, it is also the main object of my uh, ERC um, project that uh, still runs. Um, uh, it has been running since 2019 until 2023. Um, and uh, the, the title of the project is Facets, uh, like uh, facet in, in French, or facettature, facets, uh, because the purpose was to uh, investigate the meaning of the digital face in, in all its facets, in all its facets. Uh, and uh, it is an acronym that stands for uh, Face Aesthetics in Contemporary E-Technological Societies. Um, and um, initially, uh, the, the project was meant to deal with uh, much more traditional digital images of faces, like selfies. You know, I remember when <laughs> Uh, in 2016, 2017, I would give talks on selfies and uh, it, it would sound so innovative. And, and now, of course, selfies are, are, are in the Oxford English Dictionary as a word, uh, but are also very old object. It doesn't mean that we haven't uh, anything new to discover about them, but certainly it's not a bad word you know, anymore. And uh, the idea of the project was to try to understand 
how people use uh, uh, digital images of their faces um, in the contemporary, uh, let's say, technologically advanced uh, societies. And uh, actually, methodologically, it was a very naive idea. The idea was to uh, collect a facial images from uh, social networks and, uh, and then analyze them through artificial intelligence um, in order to uh, uh, understand whether there were some patterns. You know, at that time, uh, Lev Manovich, for instance, uh, had already done something similar with uh, selfie cities, you know, analyzing selfies taken in different cities in the world and uh, finding out through artificial intelligence that, uh, well, you know, the conclusions were not very revolutionary, you know, like people were smiling more in, in Rio de Janeiro than in London, but <laughs> that was uh, something we, we, we knew even before artificial intelligence. Um, but uh, we realized, myself and my team, that uh, there were some uh, unsurmountable ethical issues in this methodology. I mean, you cannot uh, simply scratch uh, digital um, images of faces from social networks and, um, and analyze them. You have to, first of all, use public images, and then you have to um, also have uh, the agreement of the people whose facial images you analyze. Um, also, well, um, I won't go into details. In the beginning, there was the idea of using Amazon Turks to uh, annotate these images, but uh, uh, it turned to be impossible because it meant to send these images out of the European Union into the Amazon market, which is not a European market. And so uh, it was impossible from the legal point of view. Uh, so we were very desperate. And at some stage, we thought, well, why don't we analyze artificial faces instead of natural faces? Because artificial faces at least do not um, refer to any proper likeness, uh, as Bernie would say. Um, I mean, they have a likeness, but it's not uh, a civic one. It's just a phenomenological one. Uh, and so there, there won't be any consequences. Um, but then, um, in the meantime, some years before, uh, a, a very young researcher, uh, a, a PhD student from uh, um, a, a, the University of Montreal, actually visiting the University of Montreal, had uh, written a, a very short paper uh, called Generative Adversarial Networks that then revolutionized completely the uh, possibility of producing artificial images through um, artificial intelligence, but also the possibility of uh, producing uh, artificial images of faces uh, through artificial intelligence. So in the beginning, it looked like something we could use methodologically, but then it became the object of the research project because now everyone is talking about artificial intelligence applied to faces and, and the face. So, uh, now there's going to be the dramatic moment in which I will realize whether I can share my presentation or not. Uh, let me see. Okay. Password. Seems that, yeah. Okay, now you should see my PowerPoint, isn't it? Not yet in the beginning of it. Okay, that's that should be the, the first slide. Could you, Gregoire, well, could you confirm it? Yes, I can confirm. Oh, okay, Perfect. good, good. So let's start from these. Um, this uh, looks like um, a um, Facebook page. And uh, it looks like a, a Facebook page in which a, two pictures uh, appear. Actually, there are many pictures, but two are more visible. 
and uh, they have this typical uh, round frame that is the typical format of frames on Facebook. And uh, well, maybe you didn't know me before this um, this talk, and of course, uh, I've been devastated by the passing of time and academic life, but you can still see that I resemble the pictures uh, that are present in this uh, Facebook uh, account. And indeed, um, you know, in simple terms, I could say that uh, uh, these are my pictures or these are pictures of myself. Uh, and these two different linguistic ways of saying it uh, are uh, you know, full of philosophical consequences you know the fact that uh, we tend to say that uh, uh, you know pictures of ourselves are also our pictures <laughs> but um, indeed I can recognize these pictures I can recognize myself my wife would probably recognize myself I hope so um, and I, I can also remember the moment which uh, this picture was taken actually not this precise picture uh, because this is a, a fragment, a, a circular fragment taken out of another picture, a picture that was taken, uh, if I remember well, in 2019 uh, in my Paris apartment. Uh, I can recognize that uh, uh, behind myself there is a bookshelf with, with old books. Uh, so it is clearly a, a picture that has... Uh, a studium and a punctum, as Roland Barthes would have said. Uh, and it has also, uh, to me at least, um, an indexical meaning. Uh, what does it mean, an indexical meaning? Well, this picture uh, exists because in some way it was produced through um, uh, contiguity, physical contiguity, with a certain ick et nunc with a certain uh, here and now, with a certain scene and setting. I was there in 2019 in my Paris apartment and my wife took a picture of myself and this a round uh, picture was extracted from that original one. So uh, uh, this is why Roland Barthes would always say that uh, pictures are systematically nostalgic because they always refer to the past they indexically refer to, to something that uh, has been in the past. Uh, this is not true anymore. We'll see that this is not true anymore. Uh, we can have not nostalgic pictures. We can have pictures to, um, uh, of something that has never, never existed in reality, but that still have an indexical quality, or at least they simulate an indexical quality. So, uh, but if you, this is uh, actually a, a Facebook profile in Italian, but uh, uh, if you read uh, on the left, there is a sentence, uh, two words that say in breve, in breve means in short uh, in, in English. And uh, the, the picture, the, the Facebook profile says that I am from, in Italian, Anversa. Anversa is Antwerp. And uh, it's a city which is ironically very close uh, to where I am at the moment, because I'm at the moment a visiting professor in Brussels, uh, uh, Belgium. Um, well, this Facebook profile is not mine. Uh, I've not created this Facebook profile. Uh, these are my pictures. And that is also my name. You know, Kripke would uh, probably uh, confirm the fact that uh, this is the name of Massimo Leone. Um, but uh, it is not true that I have only one friend, because you see, under my name, it says un amico, one friend. It's not true. I'm not so unpopular and asocial. I have a, a little bit more friends on my real Facebook profile. But the problem is, which is my real Facebook profile? You know, this Facebook profile was pointed out on me when uh, someone, a new contact, a new acquaintance, uh, tried to look me up on Facebook and came across this uh, Facebook profile with uh, my name, uh, my first name, my last name, and above all, 
uh, two pictures of mine. So he tried to add me as a friend. And of course, uh, it wasn't my persona, my civic persona, my biological persona, my ontological persona uh, beyond this uh, particular Facebook account. So um, uh, let, let's try to understand, let's try to think about uh, what my reactions were. Uh, what would be your reactions? You know, you uh, distinguished audience, if you came across a Facebook profile with your own pictures, uh, that is digital pictures of yourself, of your face and uh, uh, your own name, but uh, uh, the, the Facebook profiles you're not aware of, uh, whose existence you're not aware of, what would your reactions be? Um, well, you know, uh, on the one hand, I, I can tell you something about my reactions and then maybe we can talk about it. Uh, on the one hand, I was amused because I was thinking, well, this is a wonderful example I can use in all my classes and lectures about the face. So, wow, what a wonderful thing happened to me. And uh, um, on the other hand, I felt somehow wounded in my intimacy. Uh, I uh, felt that someone had improperly um, taken this picture of mine from somewhere uh, on the web and um, I used it in order to somehow troll me. You know, it's a, a kind of a trolling Facebook page. So uh, it was mixed feelings. You know, I was entertained and amused, but at the same time, I thought, well, this is a double, you know, construct is a doppelganger. Uh, and uh, you know that our literatures, our um, uh, uh, cinemas, uh, you know, our art histories are full with myths and episodes that relate with uh, the dread of the doppelganger or the doppelganger of the double, you know, just uh, think of the, the most recent one, the, the novel by José Saramago, or Omen Duplicado, you know, that uh, uh, gave rise also to a cinematic, uh, uh, cinematic rendering where there is someone who sees himself with the same face and the same body in a videotape and becomes totally obsessed with the idea that there is another person in the world, which is not a twin, uh, but it is somehow uh, an unknown twin uh, and an acceptable twin that goes there uh, unbeknownst and uh, acts and talks and presents his, himself with the same likeness. Well, I don't want to spoil the, the novel and uh, the movie that was taken out of it, but um, it is a, a story which is not a comedy, it is a tragedy. Um, so what should I do after coming across this uh, profile? Where I, of course, I wrote to Facebook. And I wrote to Facebook saying, well, you know, I think there's something wrong in this Facebook profile because uh, that is my picture, you know, this is the picture of myself. And, uh, but I realized that there was something stupid in this, in this sentence, in this message that they sent to Facebook, you know, how can I prove that this is my picture and not the picture of someone else? How can I prove that there is another mass in the world that looks like myself? And anyway, Facebook was very pragmatic as it is always is in these cases. And uh, it answered, well, we are sorry, but this Facebook account doesn't violate our norms. So we cannot remove it. So we can do uh, absolutely nothing, um, anything about it. And I was, of course, a little bit shocked. Uh, I thought, oh, wow, this is, you know, the typical uh, legal uh, uh, uncertainty and inefficacy that characterizes the present day social networks. But at the same time, I thought that um, there is, there's nothing to be done about this Facebook profile because this Facebook profile doesn't have any pragmatic existence. So it shows my name, it shows my pictures, pictures of my face, but it doesn't act at all. So if this uh, Facebook profile was the origin of some action of someone impersonating me, uh, acting as if 
uh, this Facebook profile was the Facebook profile of Massimo Leone, professor at the University of Turin, and so on and so forth, then uh, the situation would become legally a much more uh, problematic and probably there would be room for an intervention by, by Facebook. But you see, this is exactly the problem. Uh, where do we set the line between uh, what is pragmatically active uh, in the digital world and what is not? Because for instance, um, I, as I said to you, <clears throat> I came to know this Facebook profile because someone, a new contact, an acquaintance of mine, had tried to add this profile Facebook to his profile, profile Facebook to add me as a friend exactly because he came across these pictures. So it's true that this Facebook profile doesn't have an active pragmatic existence in the world, but it certainly has a passive pragmatic existence in the world. I see so things are. Uh, very complicated. Um, and then uh, a few months later, a student of mine uh, uh, sent me an email uh, because uh, she uh, wanted to write a paper. You know, all my students write papers on digital faces, and it, it's very useful to me because they come across with new staff, you know. And, uh, and so uh, she pointed my attention to a new app called Lensa, L-E-N-S-A, that creates digital avatars. And uh, apparently it is very popular. It was a buzz uh, you know, all around the world. It was downloaded many times. And so I, I went to the, because I wanted to read this, this paper by my student with uh, certain background knowledge. So I downloaded the app and I created some avatars uh, of my own face. Uh, so so on, the, on the left side, you see a, a selfie, very, very silly selfie of myself that I've taken this afternoon. Uh, you must believe me, of course, because uh, that could be also a digital rendering of my face. But, uh, so please follow my experiment and my, my discourse and please believe me that the picture on the left is a picture of myself. Uh, it, it is silly on purpose, you know, it's, uh, it's not because I'm a silly person, but because, you know, when I uh, downloaded these avatars, uh, these digital pictures that were presented to me as avatars of my face and uh, of the upper part of my body, uh, and of course I had to pay for that, you know, but I, I paid you know, for research, I paid. I paid and I downloaded the avatars and then again, I had, uh, what were my feelings, you know? Uh, how could I compare my feelings in looking at this image on the right um, in relation to the feelings that I had when I discovered my uh, fake uh, Facebook profile? Well, again, I was amused. I was entertained. I was even pleased. Uh, there was a, this time, well, maybe the first time to a sort of a narcissistic pleasure, you know, in seeing unexpectedly my face. In the first instance, I saw my face that was illegally exported into another world. But still, someone, uh, even if he or she was a stalker or, or, or a troll, uh, had chosen my face. So that was uh, some, somehow, you know, empowering for my for my ego, it was uh, able to uh, steer some narcissistic vibes. And in this case, the narcissistic vibes were even more powerful because of course, uh, you know, I look like myself in this picture, uh, but it is a kind of a caricature of myself. You know, the caricature has a very long uh, tradition in art history, which more or less dates back to the 15th century, the 16th century, uh, you know, the caricature of the Caracci's, for instance, in, in Italian uh, Baroque painting. There are some instances of caricatures you know, earlier in art history, but that is the great um, epoch and time of caricatures because it, it is also the big time in Western history of the arising of the self, you know, the emerging of the self and the emerging of the caricatures uh, somehow coincide you know, in visual history. So this is a kind of a caricature that uh, presents 
a sort of a caricaturesque avatar of my face, um, which hasn't been produced by an artist in, in flesh and bones, but it has been produced by uh, a kind of artificial intelligence. Well, uh, you know, I think it's not necessary to go into the technical details uh, of how this artificial intelligence works. But let me say only something that I had to feed this artificial intelligence before it could produce these um, caricaturesque avatar pictures. Because the, uh, the, the, the application lens up asked me to upload uh, about, if I remember well, 20 pictures of myself, 20 selfies, you know, from my cell phone. And of course, I knew that it was a silly thing to do also from the ethical and legal point of view, but I did it, you know, after all, I, I'm researching the staff. And, and then by using this training, the um, artificial intelligence came up with these uh, avatar pictures of my face. But then after this first narcissistic um, um, appraisal, I thought, well, but uh, uh, this application and artificial intelligence in this application has not only used those 20 pictures, uh, you know, the avatars, the avatar, digital avatar faces that are proposed to me, they're not just a concoction, a combination of those 20 selfies. There is something more. Um, and, uh, and then looking at this image on the right, uh, I thought, but you know, this picture has a virility that is not present in pictures of my face. I'm not so virile. You know, I'm not so mouldy, I'm not so muscular, you know, like my shoulders are not like this, my cheekbones are not like this. But then uh, the comparison between my own silly face and the avatar face was even more striking looking at the other avatar, you know, for the, for the price that they paid, it was of course the minimum uh, package because I didn't want to spend too much on this application. But uh, uh, I was entitled to receive 50 avatar pictures. And, and this on the right was another one. Um, and again, you know, there is a certain resemblance, but why am I wearing the clothes of a knight? You know, I've never been in any of my selfies and in any of my pictures on my phone dressed up like a knight. But I remember that um, uh, I, I, I have a, a kind of a Linus blanket that I travel with uh, everywhere in the world. It is a, a sort of a sweater. It is very ugly, but I like it. And it's very warm. A, a sweater with a hood that I bought in Ecuador. And I, I use it early in the morning when I get up, you know, and, uh, and it's cold. And so it's the first thing I, and I have many pictures with that sweater, but it doesn't have this decoration, you know? So probably, Artificial intelligence used that sweater, but added a night decoration on top. And so I start thinking, well, you know, artificial intelligence imagines that I am a uh, fearless knight, a virile, fearless knight that is ready to conquer the world, that is ready to battle. And of course, you know, the app is not uh, in the artificial intelligence is not proposing this to me only. It is proposing this to everyone who identifies himself um, as a male uh, in this application. So somehow very stupidly, very silly, but very tellingly, this application is uh, trying to titillate uh, my uh, male narcissist by picturing myself as a strong character, as a strong avatar. Um, this is uh, uh, their telling of the way in which uh, uh, tremendous gender stereotypes uh, that usually we academics do not come across because we are surrounded by usually very sophisticated communities seep into artificial intelligence. And we are shocked by them, but we are shocked by them because I have more and more impressions that uh, uh, coming across, as we academics do, uh, the products of artificial intelligence 
is a little bit like you know taking a bass going across the city of Turin and and listening to what people say in their conversations. They say terrible things, racist things, unpolitically politically incorrect things, and unfortunately, this is the average that emerges also in the imaginary world, imaginary of artificial intelligence. Well, another wonderful night. So um, to go toward a little bit more theoretical uh, point of view, um, um, there are many things that I would uh, uh, like to say about this uh, mixture of entertainment and perniciousness that is, uh, I think, present in uh, the functioning, the semiotic and the social functioning of deep fakes. Um, but there is one point in particular that I would like to stress. Uh, I would like um, uh, to invite us all to have a mental experiment, a Gedanken experiment. Uh, and uh, let's try to travel, uh, myself, Gregoire, Bernie, and all the others, in the 25 years time, or in 50 years time, uh, what will we think about deep fakes? Uh, what will our reactions about deep fakes be? Uh, what will we think about the uh, images produced by stable diffusion or, or by Dali uh, or mid journeys? Uh, what our reactions will be? It is very difficult to uh, uh, carry on this thought experiment, but at the same time, we can take some clues from the fact that we can certainly have this same thought experiment backward. You know, think about watching a soccer um, game uh, on a 1980s TV screen. You know, the impression of unreality that would come from that um, a technological device of representation. Um, but let's travel even a little bit more backward. Now there is a form of representation, even of representation of the face, that seems extremely natural to us. Uh, it is known even by children and performed even by children. Uh, this a form of facial representation is drawing. Are we afraid by drawing? Are we shocked by drawing? Uh, when we saw a, uh, a, an image of our face that has been executed through this technique, through drawing, uh, do we think about the possible ethical consequences of drawing? Uh, but there was a, a moment in history or perhaps more likely prehistory, in which drawing did not exist. Uh, at some stage in the history and the evolution as well of the human species, drawing appeared. And when it appeared, probably it was, um, I would say, not as shocking as the fakes are, but shocking as the fakes are in a different way. Uh, let's move a little bit forward in history uh, and, and let's think about perspective you know you see this uh, painting representing uh, napoleon by jacques louis david 1812 uh, l'empereur napoleon dans son étude aux tuileries uh, this is a little bit of a homage to the maison française in oxford uh, it is uh, it tremendously appealing to us, but at the same time, it is a synthesis of a long history of human representative inventions. And one of them is fundamental in this painting. It is the invention of the perspective, like drawing perspective as never, has not been always there in the history of humankind. It has been invented at some stage. And I'll tell you something, when, Jesuit missionaries first um, went to Japan that had been untouched by any Western traveler uh, up to the 16th century. And uh, these Jesuit missionaries uh, took there 
some paintings that were paintings that would already use the perspective to depict uh, some religious themes. Well, the chronicles of that time say that um, Japanese people were shocked by these images, by the vividness of them. And they thought that the Madonna would jump out of the canvas and go towards them. There are even chronicles relating um, some uh, religious conversions that would have happened because of the fact that people in Japan were all of a sudden shown images that were created through this new invention, the perspective. Does it mean that the perspective is universal? Does it mean that the perspective has a universal impact on our cognition? Well, in a way, it does. In human history, humans discover forms of representation that have a universal impact on the human cognition. That doesn't mean that they are not historical because perspective was invented. But when it was invented, it somehow resonated with something in human cognition that was deep-seated. It was deep-seated as it was deep-seated that with which a previous invention drawing resonated. Now, why, why am I saying this? I'm saying this because if we now go to the um, Washington National Gallery of Art and we look at this painting, it doesn't shock us at all. We don't even realize that there is perspective in it because perspective was invented. It shocked us for a moment. It was used to produce trompe l'oeil, which were kind of a early version, pictorial version of deep fakes. But then human beings also have a tremendous power to denaturalize these cognitive forms of illusions. So my point is we are shocked by deep fakes now, but in 10 years time, probably we'll have denaturalized their cognitive effect. Um, it doesn't mean that this effect doesn't interact with our brain. Our brain, uh, as the experts know, has a specific area, which is the right fusiform area, which is a, um, particularly dedicated to the recognition of faces. That explains, for instance, the phenomenon of pareidolia, the fact that uh, we recognize faces in clouds or in trunks or in other contexts in which no face has been intentionally represented. But nevertheless, nevertheless, despite the fact that deep fakes interact with some deep-seated cognitive um, uh, mechanisms and elements uh, of our vision, they can be denaturalized as well. They will become more and more normal. Um, and probably the question that is now in every um, newspaper, in a lot of gray literature um, that occupies also uh, the reflections of academics, and it occupies also the specific uh, wonderful seminar that has been organized by Grégoire, um, well, uh, these deep fakes will become just another form of representation. Um, they will be there. They will be all around. Um, they will be used also to, to trick and to fraud and to deceive. Uh, but at the same time, uh, they will be judged like any other visual means used for like tricking and frauding and deceiving in the past. Um, so the question is, there is no difference between a trompe l'oeil and a deep fake. Uh, so when we see, for instance, um, a painting of Napoleon, an impersonation of Napoleon represented through a cinematic device, uh, this is the wonderful um, Marlon Brando's Napoleon in Désiré. And that when we see a picture of Napoleon created by artificial intelligence uh, with this uh, typical photorealism that is characteristic of GANs, generative adversarial networks. Uh, is there really no difference? Well, from a certain point of view, there is no difference, uh, meaning that uh, uh, in 20 years time, this image created by generative adversarial networks uh, 
will look old to us, will look fake to us, will look like the product of an old technology. Um, this doesn't mean that at the moment, in the present time, uh, it doesn't have a tremendous reality effect on us, but it does have this tremendous reality effect on us because it somehow interacts with uh, a part of our cognition that is the same uh, that is interacted with by photography. So we really have the impression that there is an ontological reality beyond this representation. But that doesn't mean, again, that in 10 years time, 15 years time, 20 years time, we won't be able to denaturalize this reality effect exactly as we have denaturalized the reality effect of photography and we have denaturalized the reality effect of painting and of perspective and on drawing and on shapes. Now, it has to be said that this denaturalization uh, is not always the same in history. Denaturalizing photography uh, is not the same as denaturalizing drawing. Uh, and denaturalizing deepfakes will not be the same as denaturalizing photography because the cognitive effort to uh, be in front of a deep fake and somehow say to ourselves, this is a fake, uh, this doesn't represent reality, will be greater. And uh, uh, it will be greater, but at the same time, it will not be the greatest because at some stage, some more cognitively effective facial images will be presented to us when immersive reality devices, for instance, will be perfected, then we won't have only deep fakes, but we'll have also deep fakes that uh, are represented in three dimension, that move, uh, that are part of a digital environment in which ourselves are immersed. And maybe thinking about the current technological evolution of sensors, sensors and devices, I don't know when, but uh, maybe not too far in the future, we'll be able to touch faces in the digital environment and uh, we'll be able also to have our face touched in the digital environment. That will add an extra level of a reality effect to our cognitive apprehension of these um, official images. So there is a constant naturalization and denaturalization throughout history of a um, representations used to uh, create a simulation of a presence. Um, but uh, recognizing these analogies through time, recognizing the fact that uh, at some stage we'll denaturalize the fakes as we have denaturalized photography, doesn't mean that there aren't differences. There are, of course, differences. And the main difference will be that uh, we uh, will not uh, be anymore the protagonists of this naturalization and denaturalization. We will be at least not the only protagonists of them. Uh, when we were in front of drawings, we were in front of a, a representations and visual texts that were the outcome of a human mind and were the outcome, especially of a human body, of a human hand. Uh, the same goes for painting. With photography, things changed already. Uh, there was a human hand and there was a human mind, but the indexical link between the body of the creator of the image and the image itself, between the image and what it represented, it was mediated by a machine, by a photographic device. Um, this mediation has increased with digital photography and has increased even more with digital photography, which is now somehow a powered by artificial intelligence. So the indexicality is still there, is still there. Uh, let's see how this indexicality is still there. You know, when we look at this image, uh, which is very popular, 
these are a reconstructions through um, uh, generative adversarial networks of uh, uh, how a Roman emperors uh, might have looked like. And of course, in the gray press, in the uh, big title uh, press, these images are uh, presented and offered as the true um, pictures, the true faces of Roman emperors. But um, these are the products of an art experiment by a Dutch visual artist. But at the same time, a, an Italian a fellow looked into these images and thought, well, you know, it is a little bit strange that so many of these um, a real, uh, supposedly real pictures of um, faces of Roman emperors are blonde. You know, if you look at the sources, historical sources, you know, many of the Roman emperors uh, were coming from uh, the Italian peninsula, which is not known as the land of blonde people and uh, we're coming from uh, uh, the uh, Iberic Peninsula, which is not as well known um, as the land of, of blonde uh, people. And, um, and then he asked himself, but what are the sources that have been used to create these supposedly true facial images of Roman emperors? And um, because of course, you know, artificial intelligence, generative adversarial networks, uh, need to be trained, need to be exposed to a lot of images in order for them to come up with their own images, you know. Um, uh, and, uh, well, to make the story, long story short, um, it, it was found out that this Dutch artist did not have a very keen historical sensibility because it had exposed um, uh, this artificial intelligence, this GAN, to a lot of uh, Dutch and German iconography from the 1930s, uh, where, of course, <laughs> Roman emperors were represented as blonde, but because it was part of the uh, project of a, a Nazi ideology to present the Third Reich as a sort of an Aryan uh, new reincarnation of the Roman Empire. So, Somehow artificial intelligence, as I said before in relation to my avatars, in this case, it is much more serious and much more disquieting, had uh, uh, in a way uh, co-shared and purified <laughs> uh, these Nazi prejudices and uh, had uh, uh, nevertheless inserted them in the uh, creation of these facial images. So. This is a very uh, simple example to underline the fact that indexicality is still there. There are no no indexical images. Images must be created with reference to existing images. And uh, this is also the way in which gener generative adversarial networks work. The problem is that um, with painting, we knew that images were the product of the mind of an artist and the product of uh, the minds that would surround the artists, uh, you know, the entourage. Um, then with photography, uh, some of this indexicality was mediated by the machinic device. With digital photography, even more, the, uh, let's say, mediation was even more complicated. Um, now, this mediation is uh, mediated not only by a mechanical device, not only by a digital device, but by an algorithm that contains in itself very complex equations. And the problem of these very complex equations is that we are not really able always to detect very easily what is the causal chain between the inputs of these algorithms and the outputs of these algorithms. So uh, we are going into a complexity that uh, again resembles that of a mediating mind. Uh, these algorithms might become as complex as minds of painters, but at the same time, we cannot ask them, you know, because they don't know. Artificial intelligence uh, has 
what uh, uh, is somehow uh, and sometime also ideologically called a black box in which we cannot uh, delve. And it is precisely in this black box that uh, is situated the um, uh, secret indexicality of images produced through artificial intelligence today. So there is a continuity in history. Uh, these uh, very uh, realistic representations of reality and in particular of the face have always amused us and at the same time have always scared us, but there is also discontinuity. Uh, the protagonists of these techniques and rhetorics of amusement and of a scare uh, at the moment uh, are not uh, only human beings anymore. Uh, more and more, uh, we are replaced by our algorithms and our machines in this uh, disintermediation of representative pictorial um, uh, indexicality. And uh, more and more, we realize that the complexity of this intermediation is such that we human beings cannot really delve into it anymore. We have to use other machines and other algorithms in order to understand what is going on in the black box of the algorithms whose images we see. Um, we have, for instance, but I don't want to go into technical details, we have to um, hallucinate, as um, a, technically this operation is called, we have to hallucinate artificial intelligence that produces images in order to understand some of the mechanisms that are followed in order to uh, give rise to, this, uh, to these images. So I don't want to be too long, but uh, you know, I could have shown, of course, a lot of deep fakes. I have uh, the usual one with Tom Cruise, with uh, Obama, <laughs> with myself, and uh, and the, the possible, you know, political dangers and Putin, uh, you know, like in a deep fake. I don't think that is a real problem. You know, uh, I think this is a worrisome, but um, I think that as philosophers, at least, we should look at these uh, a forms of uh, representation and meaning making from a distant point of view and try to understand, on the one hand, how these deep fakes are nevertheless part of the long human history of dealing with, with technology. And on the other hand, uh, how they introduce something radically new in this in this continuity, and this is a little bit the the direction in which my uh, my work uh, currently goes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Massimo, for your brilliant presentation. Very rich. Uh, I was particularly convinced by the fact that you you chose a, a diachronic approach uh, about indexicality and also about the the representation of um, uh, human faces uh, through time. So thank you so much, Massimo. You're very welcome, it's a pleasure. We will have time for some questions. Uh, you can ask questions uh, in, the, in the chat window. Bernie, you have a question. Thank you. I, I didn't notice the hand raising function there. Uh, so uh, I just figured I'd turn on my camera and raise my hand uh, in the absence of other questions. Uh, there is a, um, I, I wanted to pick up a question about the consequences of the perceptions of our impressions of our likenesses. Like, what's the consequence of, like, oh, that's awesome. Or like, I feel a sense of this or like a sense of revulsion. Now, I, uh, I believe that that sense is heightened when we refer to pornography, which becomes a very uh, common uh, trope or concern. 
uh, whenever I tell people you can render these things on your own desktop, they go, oh my God, uh, about like, what porn can you render? And the, uh, you know, to me, that suggests that uh, that on the one side, Lenza on the other, imagining yourself as like a warrior or something amazing like that on, on the other, uh, that there is a variety of potential impressions that one can have evoked by this AI and prompt engineering can steer us in one or the other. Do we take this into a place where we are concerned about which impressions we make? Um, and does that mean that we limit the training of certain prompts? Does that mean that we limit the uh, sort of sentiments that can be evoked? Or do we say just, just deal with it? Or do we say stop the technology? Um, I wonder, but I also wonder how can we establish the basis for that? Not just say like, well, some people don't like this, so maybe we should stop that. Maybe we shouldn't. <laughs> How can we establish a basis for thinking that our our our, our appeared our sentiments about our uh, about our own likeness is uh, of, of consequence? Yeah, thank you, Bernie. This is a big question. Um, actually, as we know, the term itself of deep fake uh, um, is a sexual um, uh, wordplay that was invented in order to well, the reference is to deep throat. And which is a very famous, <laughs> uh, you know, erotic movie, and um, it was uh, invented as a word to designate uh, an algorithm that was uh, able to perform a face swap on porn movies and, and put the faces of famous actresses, mainly famous actresses, um, on uh, a actresses of uh, porn movies uh, without, of course, the consent of the other famous actresses. Um, and uh, uh, and there, there is a lot of uh, debate about the um, uh, ethical issues of uh, deep fakes, especially in this area of representation. Um, uh, there are uh, several articles that have been published in 2021, 2022, and also about the fact that unfortunately, uh, these techniques as well as other techniques, you know, think about hentai, you know, porn movies, uh, uh, somehow are uh, used in some circumstances to technically legitimize uh, child pornography, because exactly, you know, what you are representing is not a real uh, child face, but is a child face reproduced through artificial intelligence. So is that ethical? Is not ethical? Uh, well, uh, the debate is open, but uh, I guess that in the end, the decision uh, relies on uh, legal common sense, as it, it relies on uh, legal common sense, the fact that uh, in uh, societies, uh, legal age for sex uh, is set at a number <laughs> uh, of years, so it can be 16, it can be 18, it can be, uh, I mean, and this varies across history and across societies. Um, it is conventional in a way, uh, and uh, it is motivated by the entire cultural history of our community that reaches a general, not universal, but general consensus on the fact that below a certain age, uh, sex is illegal or sex is immoral. Or um, So I think uh, technology and deepfakes uh, will go um, through the same process. You know, there's going to be, at some stage, uh, the translation of a common sense uh, into a legal common sense that will, of course, not have a universal meaning because uh, there will always be <laughs> someone who will say, well, no, you know, there is the First Amendment, you know, we are entitled to represent, uh, you know, any kind of, uh, of faces without limitations and so on and so forth. So there's going to be a continuous negotiations and no definitive answer, of course, um, in, in time. So this is really a question for, for moral philosophers. But it is also a question for psychologists because um, there are some interesting experiments that show the consequences of seeing oneself, seeing one's face into a deep fake, uh, performing certain tasks. Um, there is a famous experiment with uh, uh, the possibility of, you know, receiving as a 
um, a patient uh, psychoanalysis by a, an avatar of Freud, and then somehow reversing the dialectics and watching yourself as a deep fake talking about your own uh, distress. And, uh, and, and in this kind of uh, theatrical deep fake, you yourself are Freud, and you must advise yourself uh, whom you look with your own face on what to do, you know, to better your situation. And apparently, uh, people come out of this confrontation, visual deepfake confrontation with their own faces uh, um, uh, with uh, a uh, sort of an heightened sense of self-awareness. Well, my hypothesis is that this will not last because this might surprise and work the first time, probably not the 10th time or the 100th time exactly for that process of denaturalization that uh, I was talking about. But um, there are also some other uh, usages of deepfake. There is an entire movie, which is uh, a Chechen movie about uh, the coming out of uh, the homosexuals in a uh, place in which they are um, persecuted and uh, legally persecuted, in which deepfakes have been used to completely mask uh, the visual countenance of characters, but at the same time uh, giving a naturalness and a reality effect to their appearing on screen. So deepfake is used also in these and other circumstances as a mask in order to give disempowered people the um, 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 security, but also the self-assurance to uh, come up uh, with their words in a, in a situation in which showing their face, their own face could be very dangerous. Uh, so of course, there are many other examples, but uh, this is to say that uh, your question opens to a very problematic um, uh, let's say moral issue, which is the moral issue of, uh, let's say, relating uh, likeness uh, with uh, common sense, ethics, uh, and the law, because at some stage, the law intervenes to, sets, to set the limits, of course. Thank you, Massimo. Are there any other questions? I will soon uh, conclude the session, which was uh, very rich. And uh, I, I really think uh, there will be a lot of uh, other debates on this topic of deep fake because uh, we just had uh, two hours to talk <laughs> about it, but uh, necessarily we will need uh, much more time to talk about this topic and we will probably have other opportunities uh, to talk about it. So I will probably conclude. Uh, I want to, once again to thank our two keynote speakers and the audience for today's session. Uh, the next session of the seminar will deal with digital humanities and the climate crisis. It will also be an online event with Zoom on the 23rd of February from 2 p.m. UK time. Thank you so much to everyone and see you soon.